My name is Violet Lenz, and I'm your host today. I am uh, very, very pleased to serve on Marmot's advisory board, and I'm also very happy to have uh, Martin Berkey, okay. our chief investment officer, who will guide us and, of course, share his uh, insights with all of us today. We have two topics to discuss. Um, number one being a live analysis of an actual portfolio. And number two, market outlook. If you have any questions or you know um, suggestions during this uh, call, please do not hesitate to just post them on the chat uh, because we would love this to be an interactive um, call with you so that we can learn from you and, and, and serve you best. And in light of serving you best, uh, we wanted to take a short poll of three questions to try to understand um, what are some of the things that's keeping you uh, awake at night and what is your starting position. So you have uh, probably on the right hand side uh, the poll. Um, first question, right? Um, um, or maybe the second by now. Um, we already have the first one, which some of you have already shared the answers with us about the biggest concerning related to personal finance. Um, the second one is what frustrates you when it comes to investing regarding your current portfolio? Could it be bad performance? Um, or maybe it's just too complex, right? In terms of the advice, or you don't have any attention from your advisors or the fees are just too high or is, is intransparent or it could be others. So please feel free to drop in your answers to that as well. Okay, so. Very good. Then let's also show the last question um, that we may have. How would you describe um, your knowledge about personal finances, um, whether it is um, fundamental um, all the way to expert, so that we can also try to tailor make our message for you to be of service today. Fantastic. There is a mix of uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> experts to, you know, fundamentals today with us. So that's exciting. Very good. So um, with that, um, thank you for sharing your views. Uh, we would like to then start with the first number one. Uh, topic of today, which is the life analysis of a portfolio. Um, we are sharing the screen with you now. Hopefully that is working on your side. And I think before we really begin, um, it's very important to understand who that person is and what the person is all about. This is actually an actual client of Moment who came to us. We have, of course, disguised uh, her portfolio as well as, uh, you know, sort of the knee. But this is sort of her story, right? Anna is actually in her 40s. Um, she actually worked in an IT firm and was able to manage to save 500,000, you know, Swiss francs over the last 10 years. As her wealth grew, she also, you know, uh, realized that in view of her children, right, the two children, she also needed to have a holistic advice about her wealth management. Um, and But the problem that she was facing was first, she went to a very large wealth manager. Performance was actually going fine in the very beginning, um, but nobody really had the time to explain to her what was happening in her portfolio. How were the stocks? being chosen? What were they, you know, in conjunction with her values? Um, and she really wanted to be involved. Uh, and with the lack of attention, she came to us to Mamot, and we were very glad to receive her and spend time with her to try to help her understand why and which, you know, um, stocks are chosen and whether they're aligned with her sustainable values. And she also wanted to be informed regularly about the market outlook, uh, which we were able to serve her for. And so for this reason, Anna came to us and asked us uh, at the very beginning to analyze her portfolio and tell her how she should make some shifts. And for that, I'm turning to our expert, Martin, uh, who will be much. able to go through some of the key points to look out for. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. 
I would actually start with a general comment before we look at the portfolio. You may ask yourself, I'm with one of the most famous biggest banks, UBS, Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, wherever. So they got so big because of a reason, because they are good. So why should uh, they recommend me products or things that are not in line with my interest? And therefore, I think it's very important to understand what is the business model of a bank. The issue is that a bank is only earning money if you have, if you're invested. They only in earn money from products or from services for if you trade, if you buy and sell a share, they can influence you to buy and sell more often. That gives them profit or they can sell you structured products, mutual funds, things like that. And then they earn money. If you only hold your account cash, everything on the account, they don't earn anything. And that is a bit the base problem of the bank that they have incentives to sell you products with a high fee that they earn a lot, but that's bad for you. So the alignment of interest is not always given. And most of the scandals you have in the press, uh, it's based on that business model that they force clients in hedge funds that go collapse, that they manipulate some uh, exchange rates, whatever, um, all is mainly based on that. I have in contrast the business model of Marmot and actually it's the business of model of most independent asset managers. They only earn money from the money they manage. So they have a management fee they get per year and they don't get any income from the product or from trading. And based on that, it's a fully alignment of interest of Marmot with your entrance. And with the banks, you don't always have that. And with the example we go in now, I can show you some uh, insights you can see in a portfolio and what can happen if a portfolio is mainly constructed that the asset manager is earning money and not you as a client. So we have here a live uh, portfolio of uh, the client who came to us. Um, it's just uh, to show you in general how such a statement looks like. You have it by your own. You have some nice charts and you have a list of all the stocks, funds, everything that is in. But actually don't see a lot. You don't see a lot of the structure, how the portfolio is positioned. Now, when we analyze a portfolio, this is a bit the structure um, we analyze it and for each of the points you see here now, we will have a slide where we can see in the actual portfolio how this is about. So the most key point, of course, is risk. The risk assessment of the portfolio and there are two parts of risk. It's the absolute risk. So it's mainly how much are you invested in equities, bonds and cash. And it's the relative risk, how much your portfolio deviates from a benchmark because if you say you have more risk than your neighbor or less risk, you must have a base. And the base for the portfolio is discussed with you at the beginning of a mandate. You define a benchmark and then it's de decided how much you deviate from that benchmark. That is the relative risk. Then also the currency is important. Of course, the return. We saw in one of the first question that return is one of the major issue and also the products and costs. So if you directly jump in now, this is now the slide I showed you before uh, with the chart, how much is invested in equities or bonds. Now we have on the bank information, liquidity, that's clear. We have shares, auction, and we have mutual funds. Now, I mean, mutual funds can also invest in equity or in bonds. So actually this picture is quite, doesn't mean a lot. You don't know how you're positioned because this uh, fund position, you don't know where it is. We have on the other side, the uh, um, system we have from uh, Morningstar, a very sophisticated system, uh, also used by institutional clients and pension funds. Um, that really shows you how you're positioned. So we have 88% in equities and the rest is in cash because also some of the mutual funds, they hold some cash. So that is first important to see how you're actually positioned. 
Um, when we talk to clients, then we start not with the return, we start with the goals. So we ask, what is your goal? What you want to reach in your life? And depending on that, we define together with you the uh, risk of the portfolio. So we don't start just with the return, five, six, seven percent. We start with the goals and the return and structure comes afterwards. Now, this slide here may look a little bit complicated, but on the box, this equity style box, you see on the bottom of this box, on the uh, left side, you see deep value and high growth. So this is actually if you are in value or in growth stocks. And if you go up the scale, you see from micro cap on the bottom to very large companies on the top. So you see with the red bottom where your portfolio or the portfolio analyze here is, is positioned and with the uh, green, Dot, you see actually the benchmark um, where the benchmark is. The, the uh, blue dots are the individual holdings you hold. And you can see on one view very easily how your portfolio is positioned. It's actually pretty close to the benchmark, but you have uh, very positions that deviate completely. And then the diverse diversification effect that comes together. I highlighted in, in red, value core and growth so that actually shows you that your portfolio have um 18 percent in value but the benchmark would have 26. so you run a bit of risk as you have compared to the benchmark as value stocks are underweight on the other side you have a very strong overweight of growth stocks now this is a portfolio that was brought to us um, some weeks ago and we had an excellent performance of growth stocks in the last year but about from November on there was a switch to value stocks and also in this year value performed better than growth so actually this portfolio is not really actual um, it was good last year but now for the challenges we have this year it's not really positioned you know if you the right way here is a bit the same. So also we see um, the uh, value growth, so book value growth, so on and sales growth. So really that portfolio is based on companies that are strong in these uh, three parts. So it's clearly a growth portfolio um, that is designed on, on technology stocks or also stocks with very high growth potential. But now in the time we have the war in Ukraine, we have interest rate uh, regime changing we see more in favor of value stocks so this portfolio will perform not very well in the last weeks and also um, uh, from now going on also here as relative risk assessment we see in which countries and region uh, you're positioned so this portfolio is quite underweight in americas and overweight in europe um, quite strongly. So last year we had a very strong performance of US and not such a good of Europe. So this was actually not the best one for that portfolio here. They didn't took profit from the very good performance from the stocks in the US. Um, also in the moment now, the war is mainly close to Europe. So also European stocks got hit a bit more than US stocks. Also that was in that case, not the best, but also such such picture we see here is something that the uh, bank or on the bank account you normally don't have in such a detail. Um, now we go on the sector level and actually we see here that this portfolio is positioned quite interesting. So normally if you say a portfolio is very much on growth focused, uh, then you would expect uh, overweight in technology, but actually this portfolio is underweight in technology, but it is overweight in industrials and in basic materials. So um, here also this portfolio deviates quite strongly from the benchmark and this manager who runs that has a very special view on the market that of course can be right, but also can be wrong. 
On the currency exposure, uh, we have the client here living in Switzerland and therefore actually the currency exposure in overview is okay that you have about one third in your main currency where you live and the rest is diversified so also currencies that also makes your portfolio much more robust it's not good if you just invest in the country you live you should also invest internationally and in taking some currency risk then we go to the performance um, on this slide here on the chart you see on the bottom you see the risk so on the left side is very low risk on the right side is very high risk and if you go up you start with zero or negative performance and the more you go up the better performance is also here is the green you have cash and with the um, uh, you have a gray kind of thing that is the uh, benchmark and if you drive a line uh, from the cash to the benchmark and this is the red line you see actually where you should be a bit in the risk return characteristic so the more you are to the right uh, on top you have the better performance but also the higher risk and this gives a fundamental thing on each portfolio more return means also more risk we see now here the portfolio as a red point that is quite below the red line and that indicates that this portfolio runs below its potential meaning for that risk you take you actually should get a better performance and this is then also one of the key messages to the client the portfolio has a special characteristic but runs quite a lot under its potential now we focus on the product selection uh, we found a very strange thing here that this portfolio was managed by dr jens erhard that is a german asset manager and they also offer own funds so now the portfolio they made for the client was mainly individual stocks some etfs and then they put their own fund in that is a little bit strange if uh, either you just buy the fund or they buy the stocks. And in this case here, we see in Amazon, that stock was actually in all three portfolios. It was in the fund itself. They bought it in addition in a portfolio and it was in an ETF. And this is quite a strange setup um, that you put the own mutual fund in, in a portfolio of yourself, of a portfolio you manage. The problem is if you do that, that you actually charge the client twice. And we have on the next slide a cost analysis. If you buy a mutual funds, there is not just one share class. They have a lot of share classes for different investors. They have a share class for retail investors, normally the most expensive one. And they have a special share class for very big clients or pension fund, normally the institutional class that uh, is charging much less fee and we see now that the asset manager was choosing the fund on the bottom that has uh, we, we see here at the total expense ratio ter excluding performance fee of more than two percent so they charge the client on the portfolio they manage and deduct it directly from the portfolio you saw before at the same time, they have their own mutual fund in with the most expensive asset class they could because there would be an asset class, uh, a fund in with a share class of only cost 0.8%. So in this case, uh, the asset manager choosing the most extensive product they had to charge you additional costs. And in our sense, that is something that is quite bizarre and is not in line with the client and we have no clue why the manager did that they if they take their own funding they should at least take the most uh, cheap asset uh, share clause we have a little a summary how we uh, the conclusion what we have here from the analysis of uh, that portfolio uh, the 100 percent investment in equity is in line with the client expectation and what he wanted um, we have the very strong overweight in US, but currency exposure is okay. So we can discuss that or 
currency is fine. The return we saw before, it runs much more below potential and they uh, charge costs that are not understandable. So we actually recommend here to the client to change a mandate, to switch it to another provider that is more fair from the cost side and could deliver a better performance. Thank you, Martin. So it's really important for an investor to think about all these four main questions when it comes. And if they have a portfolio that they want you to analyze, you could potentially help them with that using these four structured um, questions and sub-questions. Exactly. With each portfolio we get, we analyze it with the same concept. We put the data in our special uh, data system. It's called Morningstar. Um, then we can analyze it in, in that detail uh, you saw in the example before and can show that to the client and give him advice if he should stay with the bank he is or if he better choose a different mandate or uh, a different provider. Understood. Thank you for that. So then maybe let's also move on to the second topic of today, which is market outlook. Um, and I think for market outlook, it's also important for us to let you know um, that at Mammoth, we are able to provide you um, with a market newsletter, um, kindly written by Martin on a weekly basis. Um, it basically recaps what has happened uh, in the last week and also what could potentially be the outlook for next week uh, and the next coming months and the year. Um, what I find personally very interesting about this market outlook, there are three good reasons. I read it um, every week. Number one, it's very easy to read. Um, and it's simply us uh, explained with charts and text. So it is much, um, is actually a joy <laughs> to read a market outlook. Um, the second thing is that it's always changing. The topics are changing. So it's current, it's relevant. Um, it actually highlight some of the highest concerns that I or other investors may have. And I think somehow Martin is reading our minds and is <laughs> posing them and answering them. And of course, last but not least, uh, Martin has been very, very kind to be very proactive and made intra-weekly reports during the uh, volatile market sessions that we have um, seen in the past couple of weeks. So thank you, Martin. And if any of you are interested to you know, receive the newsletters, we'll be more than welcome to you know, subscribe you to it. Just reach out to us and we will be then providing you with an automated delivery each week to you your mailbox. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important, Martin, to acknowledge that, you know, um, it has not been the easiest of times um, for all of us. Uh, and especially also we have colleagues in Ukraine and Russia that uh, we work uh, very, very closely with. Um, and of course, our thoughts and prayers are with all of them. Um, and we are in communication with them to see that they are safe. Uh, but it's also in such challenging times that we also have the fiduciary duty to look at the market for our clients, but also potentially to see if there are opportunities um, that may be you know, relevant to them. And so with that in mind, I think that it's worthwhile. We have already received a few questions from some of the, you know, clearly the poll has shown, right, that the, there are interests of, the, of our, our participants, our dearest participants today. And so let's really try to answer the one. I think the first one is inflation. That seems to be the highest thing on people's minds. Oil price is going up. You know, the US government has started to increase interest rates and a lot of hikes already, you know, um, in the market, priced in the market. So what is your, uh, you know, perspective of inflation or could that be stagflation, right, uh, as well? Yeah, I mean, before I go on with that first, I want to say if you have some questions, please put it in the chat. We can see that and answer it uh, immediately. And I also have prepared now some slides I can, um, I can uh, show to you. Um, what we see here a bit is the long-term treasury yield. So the, the interest rates you have in the US since uh, 19, uh, 19th century. So it's, uh, it's very long time back, you can see that. And we actually see that since about 1990, 85, we only have rising interest rates. 
inflation went down, inflation was not a problem, and the interest rates went down and down. So for an investor who invested in bonds, it was actually a very good time because you always have interest rates and you make capital gains on your bonds. But now it seems to change. We have high inflation figure and the central bank in the US already decided to uh, put up the uh, interest rates to hike them. And um, we think that also in Europe, something similar will happen. We actually see on this table here that 100% of the market participants already now expecting up to five hikes in interest rates in the US um, until the mid of 23. And the majority is actually calculating with nine hikes. So that will bring, if you go back to the uh, slide here, that would easily bring up the interest rates to four to five percent or six percent. So actually we see here that this trend line is broken. Um, so everybody who has a portfolio and is mainly invested in bonds should be very careful of the situation that happens now. And actually the uh, concern most of the people have of uh, the Russian invasion in Ukraine and also the inflation are currently very much linked together. I have here the example of the oil price until 1918 um, up to today. And you can actually see that uh, when the COVID crisis started, the uh, oil price dropped 70% because everybody feared that now the industry is stopping and nobody is consuming. So it, it dropped quite a lot, but recovered pretty well. But if you drop 70% to be on the same level as before, it had to go up 190%. And this is called the so-called base effect. Of course, when the oil dropped, it had a huge impact on inflation and inflation dropped. But when then the oil price surged again, not, not 70, but 190%, uh, the inflation had very high readings of in US of seven or eight percent. The central bank said that base effect is the main reason you have uh, a high inflation, but actually if you compare it to pre-COVID level, nothing happened. So they keep the interest rates low and maybe low too long. And we see here that even after that, now we had the same level after COVID, the oil price rise quite strongly. So if you take the oil price from the low of the COVID crash until now, we have a surge in oil price of more than 400%. And of course, this has a very high influence on the price, especially on the, uh, in the US on the markets, um, because in the US, the oil and, and gas is very important to run the industry. The people move, oil price is very important. It's like, like a hike in uh, interest rates that already happened. So the very high readings we see in inflation is mainly based, based on the oil price. And now with the Ukraine crisis, we even see that the oil price reacted even more. I put here on the chart when the, when the war started and it actually came down a little bit again and is now is fluctuating between the value of about 110. Um, here I have a chart that is showing you the oil price and the probability that the US economy is going into a recession. So you see here always when the oil price was peaking there was uh, sh soon afterwards with the gray shadow, a recession in the US. And the level with the getting difficult is about by 110. That's about the level we are now in the oil price. So if the European Union should now decide not to buy oil and gas anymore from Russia, or Russia is not delivering it, the oil price will surge even more and that will most probably cause a recession in the US and worldwide. And this in a situation where we already have very low interest rates, 
So it's a very dangerous situation we currently uh, see on the market. Um, we have here a, a slide that shows the effect that has on the uh, companies. And the very famous bank, Morgan Stanley in the US, has developed their own model, uh, a leading indicator that should show you a bit in what direction the profits of the companies should go. So the earnings per share, so the earnings, the profit they uh, announce per share of, of the company. And we see here that this yellow line is dropping quite fast. And the blue line is the actual figure. So we actually see here that the earnings uh, per, share, per share growth would go down to more or less zero or four or five percent in the, in the next uh, months or in the next quarters. So that actually is for the stock market a quite a bad sign and um, not ideal time, maybe your place to invest. But we think a bit that we run in a direction where we would have slow growth but high inflation based on the commodity prices and still on the after COVID things. And actually this situation, low growth, high inflation is, tall, is called stack, stagflation. And the last time we had a stagflation was between 1974 and 1981. And in this slide here, you see what with asset class or sector were actually the best place to be. And one of the key findings here is value. That is the second from the left. So if you are positioned in value stocks, um, then also in such a situation, you had a performance that were above the market. And also small caps profit quite strongly from it. We have not changed to invest in small cap now because they start normally outperforming after the second or third hike in interest rates. We only saw the first one. So we will start adding small caps to our portfolios very soon. And here also maybe an interesting slide. We compared the uh, European stock market of the time of the Iraq war when the US uh, invaded Iraq with the war we have now in the Ukraine. And you can actually see that at the beginning when the war started, there is always quite a bad performance because um, the market doesn't like when it's not clear what happening or uncertainty. And uh, when it was clear what happens, then the market start to perform again. And we saw also in the last, it was a chart about one and a half weeks ago, we are now quite higher. And in the last days you saw that the market already recovered a little bit. Um, we expect a bit the same that time and also in connection with the next slide where we see the fear and greed index. Um, so this is a special index that is calculated by CNN money with about five or six underlying indicator that try to see if the clients or the investors on the stock market are very optimistic um, or if they are very pessimistic. So if they fear that the whole market is collapsing. And the thing the important to know here is that the market is mostly doing the opposite of what everybody is, expects. So if everybody is afraid of a market collapse, then everybody sold already all the equities and investments they have. So only small new investors that are jumping in in the market and use the cheap prices to buy are driving the market up. And so this contraindicator showing us that we are on a very low level, on a very fear level. And in such a situation, you normally see a rebound of the market. So exactly what we see now. So our prediction is a bit that we actually saw uh, the low point of the market already now. And um, that we uh, probably have, it could be now a good time to start investing again. Of course, if you have not invested yet, it would not be to put 100% in, but one third, half of the money you have aside could be now a good time uh, to start uh, investing. 
um yeah also this questions um uh is is asked in in the chat i can see here of the political influence or a situation that will have um i before i answer that i want to show that slide here that slide here shows you the performance of the standard and poor of the u.s market over the very long term and in red the red dots are all the reasons you had to sell it's a crisis it's a war it's uh, something else went wrong um, so always people had reasons to sell but how you can easily see on the chart you should not have sold even so if everybody around you said sell 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 it was good to stay in and if you invest you should have a long-term perspective to reach your goals and you should not get panicked by a situation like we see now where the market is shaking the market is never going up in a straight line it's going up and down that you can see here good and if the market drops it's normally a good time to uh, start investing maybe to come back on the uh, question in the chat also on, on the general influence of the uh, ukraine crisis the thing is a bit what we see here is not a normal crisis we call that in in financial industry a black swan it is uh, based on a book of nicholas taleb um, who actually uh, talked about situations where something happens that nobody had in consideration so even if you make a risk analysis of the portfolio nobody thought it could happen and black swan is it called because for hundreds of years thousands of years it only existed white swans and then uh, a traveler went to australia and first time saw a black swan and from that time on it had white and black swans but before it only had whites so it is the expression for a risk that nobody expected and were out of everybody's mind and we see that a bit here to have a conventional war more or less in the middle of europe is not something anybody had into consideration and so it was clear that at the start the uh, stock markets and the markets reacted panically but now when this risk is in the market priced in the prices already we see a recovering of the situation now so uh, this was a bit in general a bit how we see the market and the current situation so of course uh, you're very uh, happy if we ask uh, more questions um, we also have the uh, question who you can uh, call later on i think anybody of us if you go on the mail where you was the invitation for this talk you see a number on the mail you can call this number and uh, you can reach us uh, anytime you want Great, thank you, Martin, for that. Um, but maybe if I may pose a question to you, because sure. you showed us the fantastic, uh, you know, chart of reasons to sell. Um, but there was also a concern in the poll of the, you know, our participants today, with a potential high valuation, as well. So, um, how can we ensure, right? Or are we at high valuation number one today? And number two, how can we enter um, if it's, if we are in that situation? You always have to see a bit in in, in the details of of the structure of the market. So the overall market may be overpriced, and uh, but if you look a bit how the index and the benchmark is constructed. You currently have an extremely strong overweight of technology stocks in the US stock market, uh, in the benchmark. So um, you have a very high valuation still of a lot of technology stocks, but you have a very low valuation in a lot of value stocks. Nobody in the last years wanted to buy value. Also with the pandemic, this growth and the internet stock got a very strong boost and actually we saw an outperformance of growth comparing to value since about 10 years so that is a very unusual situation because in each statistic you go back over a long term value was always better than growth 
And this time we had an underperformance of value since more than 10 years. So based on what we discussed before and the change of interest rates, we expect now a recovery of value. And you find quite a lot of good value stocks, solid companies that still have a decent valuation. But you should be very careful with, um, we call them non-profitable stocks in general. It's even Goldman Sachs is calculating an index on that. There were a lot of internet uh, and technology stocks that came new on the stock market. And since they are traded, they never made a profit. So they have to finance all day your business uh, with credits. Um, and this costs now more as the interest rates goes up. So they have less and less time that their business model works. So there are companies like Slack, like uh, also Uber, and a lot of companies of names you know who are in that situation. So such companies, you should be very careful, but company like Coca-Cola, Nestle, typical value companies, they have still a valuation that are still quite reasonable. And also, if we go on with this projection we have as a stagflation, you also saw that value companies are the place to be. So you have lower valuation and you have a better safety in case of this stagflation scenario. And how about bonds, Martin? I mean, should we be investing in bonds considering the potential rate hikes that are already priced in, but coming for sure? What is your view on that? On the bond side, we are very careful. Um, I mean, we really think that the interest rates are rising quite substantially, also in Europe. Then uh, to buy a normal bond is not the right thing. You have special cases like it's a long times in high yield bonds or in certain sectors where bonds can be a good value. But uh, we actually recommend to our clients to keep the bond position as low as possible. We invest sometimes in absolute return strategies. So this is a possibility you have. Understood. We have a next question coming in. Um, do you consider the gender lens when investing? Uh, we do that on, on two occasions. Um, as you may know, our key investment philosophy is not to buy individual equities and stock. We buy the best investment talents that we can find on the market. We just think we cannot say here if a Samsung or an Apple is the better company. But if Warren Buffett, one of the richest men of the planet, wants to know that, he gives the call to the company and have a lunch with the CEO of both companies the next week. And such a sophisticated investor with a lot of money in the back, he has much better information. And we invest in line with these investment talents. And you can get these talents and invest with them with investment funds. So normally the big investors and the good one, they offer investment funds and we choose these investment talents. So we try to focus here also to, to give a focus on female investment talents. You have a special portfolio that only or mainly invest in female investment talents. So you have your money then directly invested by women. And we also invest in some strategies um, that uh, focus on companies where you have a mixed board uh, from the gender side. So or all have a female CEO or a mixed uh, gender lens. But in my eyes, it's important is that compares us to a lot of competitors. We are not investing just in that. We take that into consideration. We take it in as most as possible. But if you would construct a portfolio only with female talents or only with companies uh, run by a female CEO, you run quite extreme risks. And this is then not in line with the targets and the goals you have when you invest in a portfolio. So we try to combine these two worlds together that you have a solid portfolio where you can sleep well, but still have this bias on the gender side. Martin, sleep, uh, thinking of, you know, sleeping well, I think it's also important for, you know, our participants today. I mean, thanks to your, you know, guidance of how to actually analyze a portfolio and what we should actually think about in this market situation, that they should also perhaps, 
you know, ask their current advisors, right, in this structured manner, the questions that uh, they deserve the answers to. I think you have prepared um, with Tom also a letter mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, yep. our participants could send to their banks, yep. right? Uh, you you yeah. may ask yourself how I can now evaluate my portfolio the same way we did it. And the first key point is to have more information than you have on your normal uh, report. And uh, the easiest thing is actually, if you just send a letter to your bank to ask all these questions. Now you may say how I should write this letter. Now we have written that letter for you. So we have a standard letter you can see here and we will send that to all of the participants of the call today where we can ask the bank all the questions. We have in yellow the points you should change, your name and address of course, and then you can send this letter one to one to the bank and see how they react and how they answer your questions. You can also give the answers back to us and we help you analyzing it, but you immediately see how they react on such a letter. Uh, we already used that several times and sometimes the answer come back. Are you crazy? Do you think we answer you that questions for that amount you invest with us? And even the client had two, 300,000 invested. So that already shows you that the bank has something to hide and you may change the, um, uh, your provider. So we are very happy to uh, offer you that letter as a kind of a gift that you also attended now the, uh, the call today that you can ask the same questions to your bank and get the information that you get a better performance and a better portfolio. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So I think what's important, I think, at Mahmoud is that we really do care about every individual client, right? Um, what their you know aspirations are, what their targets are, what the dreams are, but also how they want to you know achieve um, their financial freedom. Um, I think it's going to be helpful for them uh, with this letter. And of course, uh, Martin, as you have mentioned, if they have any questions concerning the letter or on the portfolio that they have today, they sh simply you know, should not hesitate to contact us. Also to receive the newsletter, um, which is also another gift uh, from, from Mahmoud. Um, and of course, it's very important for us to raise the awareness um, right, for women everywhere and, and, and to create a community of like-minded investors. Um, and so we can only thank you so much um, for your precious time and also Martin for your great thank insights. You. And um, I think it's just a very beginning uh, of a series of webinars that we hope to organize, uh, hopefully now also potentially in-house events, considering the situations, of course, that could change. And we would like to once again, thank you, sending you lots of greetings, warm greetings from the Mahmoud family to you all and wishing you a very, very great start to the week. Thank you for your time. And thank you also from my side. I really hope we can make such a session once live and see you physically in our rooms. And uh, then really also that we can um, connect with each other and, and start growing with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.